Hello, I'm Silvia Zorzetti, a senior engineer at Fermilab and the Ecosystem Lead for the Separate Conducting Quantum Materials and Systems Center, a Department of Energy National Quantum Information Science Research Center. I am the moderator of the full scientific session, Quantum for the People, Connecting Quantum Information Science and Society. Thank you for joining us. This presentation is one of the three pre-recorded videos focusing on speakers' material before all the panelists come together in February during the live session. In this video, our panelist, Alexandra Boltaseva, will discuss the merging of artificial intelligence and quantum science. Later in this video, Alexandra and I will dive into material further. Alexandra Voltaseva is the Workforce Development Leader for the Quantum Science Center, which is also a Department of Energy National Quantum Information Science Research Center, led by Oak Ridge National Laboratory. She is a Ron and Dottie Garvin Tonges Professor of Electrical and Computing Engineering at Purdue University. The Quantum Science Center is dedicated to overcoming key roadblocks in quantum state resilience, controllability, and ultimately the scalability of quantum technologies to realize the quantum future. It comprises 16 institutional partners. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And many thanks to AAAS for holding this uh, scientific session on how we better engage people in quantum information science and uh, technology. As Sylvia already said, I am involved with the Quantum Science Center as a workforce lead, but I will be also speaking uh, from the perspective of a researcher and my own research field that incidentally is connected to a previous technological revolution that literally changed our lives. So how do we actually go from basic research to what we would call a quantum smart society when quantum revolution is already upon us? As I said, I would like to make a link to the field I'm working with, and that's the area of photonics, optics, and optical technologies. I don't have to convince anyone that optical technologies are all around us and they change the way we process information and we communicate. The fact that you are watching this recorded session is because we have optical fibers and optical communication systems. So it's literally fueled the rise of information society we have nowadays around us. We have optical technologies in healthcare, in sustainable energy conversion. It is driving our digital economy. It's making a huge impact in applications for environment, agriculture, and of course, on our social lives. We are all connected virtually um, at these times. If we look at this area of technologies, um, which is now part of our everyday lives. I mean, we can um, ask anyone on the street or our kids, they know we are using Wi-Fi and they know that there are some optical cables coming into your house to bring your internet and the Netflix streaming to you. But what sometimes is not appreciated enough is that behind any disruptive technology, such as optical communication systems and information technology at large are breakthroughs in fundamental science. And I put this slide up with the Nobel Prize winners that correspond to breakthrough advances in fundamental science that all together actually led to the emergence of the information uh, technologies and specifically optical technologies why optics is playing such a huge role in um, information technologies. It's simply because light has the fastest speed on Earth. Nothing propagates faster than light or photon, which is a quantum or particle of light. So it is extremely fast and it has huge bandwidth and everything to satisfy our ever increasing need for processing and exchanging our information 
faster. We are now in the heart of the emerging quantum revolution. If again, we look at recent fundamental advances and Nobel prizes, it is about quantum science and technologies, new states of quantum matter, controlling our matter and light down to quantum level. Photonics and optics is going to play critical role in the quantum information science and technology, because as I already said, we are operating at the speed of light. So we are ultimately going to transmit um, and, and, and maybe process uh, quantum information at the speed of light. So light is the fastest messenger and um, photons as the particles of light, um, they also quite uh, stable, we call them immune to decoherence. It means that um, we are not going to lose this information that easily. So why we believe that this technology revolution in quantum information science and technology should be merged together with another ongoing revolution on artificial intelligence and big data. If we look back at how our society and technologies has developed, you will see that we went from the first industrial revolution uh, fueled by steam-based machine to electrical energy-based to computer and internet-based knowledge. And the third in industrial revolution is in fact, the very first information revolution that led to the society we have nowadays. Right now, happening concurrently are the quantum and AI information um, technology revolutions. So we do believe that only true merge between the two approaches would lead to breakthrough advances in fundamental science and new disruptive technologies. And in fact, we do already have a proof that it is upon us. It has already started with a huge investment from the government across the globe but in both fields, we are witnessing the rise of the centers like the one we are representing here, both from the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, and many more. So we do believe that merging quantum and AI is going to bring transformative and disruptive advances to um, advancing our understanding of quantum material and uh, the nature at large, but also promote new technologies. As predicted by analysts and everyone in the field, the ongoing AI and quantum revolutions are going to have even bigger impact than the previous revolution that once came with the development of transistors and lasers. And let me remind you that the invention of laser was first a solution looking for a problem. And look now, nowadays everyone knows what lasers are there everywhere and they entered our homes. So the next step for us is to see how do we build this culture around quantum and AI such that we are as comfortable with that as we are with optical technologies. So the merge of quantum and AI is going to enable the next generation of cognitive systems, internet of things, very secure, unhackable quantum communication systems, quantum computing, and quantum sensors that are already entering the market. When it comes to my own field of dealing with light, we go down to quantum level, but really controlling the photons um, down to a single photon or maybe to a couple of correlated or entangled photons. So we can get ultimate control over light at the quantum level by working together with machine learning algorithms and helping us to design better structures for very complex circuitry of future devices, to perform quantum measurements in a fast and efficient way, and to enable completely new ways of studying 
quantum materials in addition to emerging technologies. One far-fetched example that I can give you is that the merging of these two fields can enable a thought after detectors for dark matter. And as I already said, we believe in the future of quantum photonic communication systems, quantum photonic computing, and quantum sensors. What do we need for that? Well, we need to create quantum workforce, which is again, very similar to the previous revolution where we had to create engineers that would be able to work in the semiconductor industry. So there is a big effort across the globe and in this country that is devoted for the training of the next generation of quantum scientists and engineers. National Science Foundation, DOE funded centers, universities are working together in bringing um, scientists and researchers from different disciplines and enabling new curricular and new possibilities for studying this exciting field. It is also important to work together with industry because the development of this technology happening both at universities and industries and government labs at the same time. And let me just finish here, and I look forward for discussing more. Thank you, Alexandra. This was an eye-opening presentation, and I have a few questions for you. So the first question that I have is, uh, what is the main challenge emerging these uh, two technologies like uh, artificial intelligence and quantum computing, and if there is a main bottleneck? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for asking that, Sylvia. I do think uh, that um, the challenge in merging the two approaches um, is really that um, this area is where historically somewhat disconnected. And if you take a physicist trained in uh, quantum physics and um, a computer scientist developing machine learning algorithms, we do speak slightly different languages. So we have to learn each other's language and create um, ample opportunity for us to um, discuss uh, beneficial projects. And it has to go both ways. You know, not only we apply machine learning algorithms for advancing quantum science and technology, but we also have to come up with um, an interesting approaches, for example, for developing physics driven algorithms that would be um, changing and shaping um, the field of fundamental AI. And can you provide a concrete example of future capabilities that marries the two technologies, again, AI and quantum? So the capability that uh, uh, marries uh, both technologies um, um, can again go both ways, as I said. Well, the first one is obvious. If we have a quantum computer, then obviously we have an um, ultimate um, simulation and ultimate information processing that could help us to solve really complex problems and speed up and advance um, the machine learning algorithms. So this is more of a quantum for machine learning or for AI. It also works um, the other way. So we can actually also think about classical machine learning as it's applied um, for the development of quantum um, devices and, and, and materials. And one specific example would be to enable uh, machine learning assisted quantum sensors with unprecedented sensitivity. So something that you wouldn't be able to do if you just look at the data that you are get. So increasing the sensitivity of let's say uh, future dark matter detection could come with advances in algorithms that help us to um, look and analyze the data. Thank you. And what do you think is the timeline for this technology to be available for in general for the society? Uh, and how long uh, this technology is, let's say, demystified and generally understood by non-specialists? Mm -hmm. Well, things are happening really, really fast. So if we look into the availability of quantum solvers and um, approaches for quantum computing. There are many competing platforms and many 
um, successful companies that are already out there pushing for quantum computing. And in addition to um, giants like Microsoft and IBM, we have uh, companies like called Quanta, um, INQ, and uh, QERA that are ready to offer us uh, something that we would call intermediate quantum computers, where you already have you know, a um, couple qubits available to perform this simulation that would outperform the classical computing. Um, but the truth is that quantum technology is not only and, and uniquely about quantum computing. As I mentioned, it's also about secure quantum communications and about quantum sensors. And quantum sensors are already entering the market. So quantum sensors is the very first, um, let's say, a product of this new revolution that I believe will be uh, around, um, well, everyday life quite soon. And let me actually um, rephrase uh, something that um, uh, the founder of uh, Cold Quanta company, um, Dana Anderson said, um, he said that, um, well, in order to uh, demystify this area and to really make it part of the daily life, uh, we should be able to uh, enter every home at some point with, uh, uh, with a quantum toaster. You know, there definitely uh, would be some kind of device that would be comparable to consumer electronics that we have nowadays that came with the, that was a result of the previous technology revolution. Thank you, Alexandra. Now, talking about your role as a, a workforce development leader for uh, the um, Quantum Science Center. Um, so what do we as a national lab and research center need to do to draw students and the early career scientists, researchers and engineers uh, to this area of work? Well, first of all, um, they have to feel the excitement. <laughs> they have to feel that this is something that's going to, to transform fully the way we live. And the excitement is there. And now we just have to make sure that uh, the students and, and, and postdocs would have an opportunity uh, to gain the required knowledge. And many partners are working really hard to identify um, uh, the proper training that would be needed for the next generation of quantum scientists and engineers. Uh, quantum Economic Development Consortium are surveying many companies and what requirements they have for quantum engineers. National Science Foundation centers are working hard on creating quantum curriculum. And DOE centers are also focusing on um, how we provide um, uh, additional training to postdoctoral students um, and in uh, uh, collaboration with industry, how do we make sure that there is also a possibility for existing engineers in IT uh, realm to actually get um, extra training in quantum. So what qualifications you would need for that? So this is a very um, dynamic um, an extensive area of, uh, uh, of research and initiatives at the moment. So a common question that we usually receive from students and interns that are interested in pursuing career in quantum information science, but you know, talking with you in AI and quantum information science is even more initial is what kind of track should, should they follow? And if there are specific courses uh, that, uh, you know, can, can, can bring them in this uh, in this career path so what will be your advice for them uh, is there any class that you can advise them to take and uh, if there are other measures that they should take mm -hmm. well first of all as i said um we should um we should really be really active in creating these opportunities for students and i know there are many universities that has already created programs in uh, let's say quantum engineering and they would have the needed aspects in the training and you know uh um in, in in physics and with some elements of computer science and i think that's really important so if you if we really uh want to merge the two technologies together and 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 harness the fruits of it 
um, we have to make sure that students are exposed to both fields early in their career path. So if you are a physicist, well, do take a class in machine learning, learn the coding to make sure that at least you would speak the same language. And the same goes the other way. If you are doing algorithms, try to see what the hardware or the physical part is doing. And overall, merging this virtual and physical part is in the focal point for many engineering uh, programs, including Purdue. We really strive for creating this uh, um, forum um, expertise exchange and very tight collaborative link between the physical and uh, virtual part. And that's something that students should keep in mind. You have to understand both worlds. But now, now we talk about the role of national labs, the talk of the research centers, and then um, what students should do if they want to pursue a career in this field. But then how, how do you see university lab and industries uh, collaborating to bring AI and quantum together and what role uh, would each of them play? Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you. And I, I already elaborated on this a little bit. Um, as I see it, well, first of all, it has to be coordinated effort. And I'm happy to see that, for example, DOE centers are uh, working together and, and trying to cross pollinate and then have some joint activities. Um, I would say that um, many NSF centers are, for example, focusing on curriculum development. And that's what uh, DOA centers uh, would not necessarily focus on. So the DOA centers would be um, then focusing on uh, postdoctoral training and, and uh, you know, senior graduate students training and uh, training of uh, researchers in collaboration uh, with um, with big companies. Um, but overall, um, we just have to make sure that we have resources available to everyone and make them also publicly available so that everyone can actually learn more. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure that your presentations and uh, your thoughts will be inspiring for many students and, interest, and the interns that are um, uh, attending this session. Um, is there a scientist or a researcher who inspired your career? Well, if I think about a single scientist, and there are many, of course, including my peers and my mentors, um, but if I would think about one scientist, um, I would think about a portrait of Maria Sklodowska Curie in, um, in the middle school in my math class. Um, she is an incredible um, inspiration. And if I may uh, actually, um, say more, um, and I would mention Nikola Tesla because um, his level of creativity is unparalleled. He would also be my hero. So is there a, a favorite book or paper uh, on AI in quantum? Um, what would you recommend for people to read to learn more about this field? Well, I might sound very traditional, uh, but I would refer students who want to start learning about um, that to Richard Feynman's lectures in physics. Um, he is the um, hero for many, and he is one of the most visionary scientists um, that I can name. And it's interesting that while we're discussing this um, technology revolution in uh, quantum, uh, Richard Feynman was the one who in, in his uh, famous article, Plenty of Room at the Bottom, predicted both the rise of uh, nanotechnology and quantum computing. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you to the audience and AAAS for this opportunity. Thank you again, Alexandra, for your thoughtful presentation. I would also like to give a reminder that this is only one of three spotlight videos focusing on individual work of speakers before they all come together in February in the live panel, Quantum for People, connecting quantum information science and society. Please check the AAAS annual meeting website for the panel's date and time.
So again, thank you, Alexandra, for in the, the audience, and I will see you live in February. Thank you.